we have with us here this uh, wonderful young butcher, uh, Rob Levitt, and uh, the, the, the butcher trade at this point in our history is um, it's basically it, it's basically non-existent, statistically insignificant number of butchers in the United States today, although it's growing very fast. And I wanted to um, just open with a couple of remarks contextualizing this conversation and thinking about the ethics of meat. And I think there's two, there's basically two levels that we have to deal with. One of them is uh, the, you know, the obvious one of factory farming. And I think we can probably all agree here that factory farming presents a lot of really difficult moral, moral and environmental challenges, um, not just in terms of animal welfare, but all, all kinds of other ways as well. And the second one is the whole sort of, let's call it the vegan question. Is it okay? Is it, you know, how do we justify killing animals in order to eat? And let's put that one off to the side for a second and, um, and start with the, with the factory farming question and, um, you know, how it is that, I think it's really interesting how it is that the butcher trade ended up fading away. And, uh, you know, one thing that I think is always really important in these conversations is that we don't uh, have this sort of uh, false idea that we once had this wonderful, humane, and just food system, and then in the last 40 or 50 years, factory farming took it over and messed everything up. Um, I think that, you know, agriculture has always been very difficult. Um, it's probably never been very pleasant to be a farm animal, um, in, in, in most cases. Um, and, um, and if you think about Chicago and the history of the stockyards, um, and the, you know, the Uptown Sinclair book, The Jungle, we know that you know, 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, things were really, really difficult in uh, the meat industry. It was already very consolidated. Uh, there were a few giant meat packers. Um, working conditions were obviously dreadful. Um, you know, famously, uh, Sinclair documented there were some food safety issues going on in these, uh, in these uh, stockyards. And, uh, but one thing that, that's interesting, and his book kind of helped spark this, is that after that book came out, and through a lot of labor organizing, the, the meat industry did go through a transformation. And by the post-war era, um, meat packing was a solid middle class job. Um, it was a very unionized job. And in the, in the great American manufacturing, uh, post-war manufacturing boom, meat, meat packing jobs paid as much or more than manufacturing jobs. Meat packing workers participated in the, uh, the post-war American boom. And as recently as 1980, their wages were on average 15% higher than manufacturing wages. Meanwhile, at the same time, so this is like the slaughterhouse workers. At the same time, all over the country, in every city and town, there were small neighborhood butcher shops. And there was this base of butchers. And where you got your meat was at the butcher shop. And this was a, a middle class profession. And a part, part of sort of uh, neighborhood economics, it was, na you know, it was like people's food dollars in those, in, in those times, not to you know, go back, you know, not to present a falsely romantic uh, um, picture, but people's food dollars, when they were spending money on meat, went into this small uh, butcher shop. Who, um, the, the butcher probably lived in the neighborhood and sort of built neighborhood economics. Um, something changed in, you know, basically with the, uh, the transformation of the U.S. economy that happened in the 70s. There was this attack on on wages um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the workforce, and the, the, the meat packing companies especially did a, basically a brutal pushback against labor organizing, and very quickly, starting in the early 80s um, and extending to today, the gains over the decades made after Sinclair's book were uh, evaporated, and working conditions in, um, in these uh, factory scale slaughterhouses deteriorated to now it's one of the lowest paid uh, jobs in the United States. Um, basically the uh, native born workforce has fled that, fled that job. Uh, it's largely immigrant workers who have very few rights. Um, conditions have gotten so bad and so dangerous that in 2005, 
Human Rights Watch put a, a report out called Blood, Sweat, and Fear about the industry. And this is a group that usually is looking at sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, refugee camps in, 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 uh, in, in war-torn regions is here in our meat industry uh, giving this devastating report on um, uh, low wages, abusive, uh, anti-union uh, activity, abusive workers, and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, the butcher trade essentially, these, these, the meat companies basically rolled up the butcher trade. And how they did that was they started to mechanize a lot of the things that that butchers do uh, within their factories, and basically um, supermarkets began to, uh, their, their own butcher sections began to take over, and they would get meat already almost all broken down, and uh, essentially a de-skilling of this labor force, and, and they basically drove all of the old butcher shops across the United States out of business, and you, you get the situation where now your food dollar, if you're living in a neighborhood, instead of your, your meat dollar going in, into this butcher shop, now it's going into this sort of uh, probably multinational uh, grocery chain that has taken over um, and is, uh, is, is, uh, is selling, cheap, you know, selling you cheap meat uh, from a de-skilled labor force. And, um, and the other thing that happened, I think, at the same time was the rise of factory farming, and that basically meant that you know, in the 50s, when you had butchers and meatpacking workers all doing okay, you also had widely diversified farms all across the country that would have pigs and maybe cows and maybe chickens, and it was uh, geographically very spread out. And then you saw at the same time with the rise of uh, essentially cheap corn and soy in the 70s, the, the rolling up of that as well, uh, thousands and thousands of farms went out of business or learn to specialize, and you got this, this ramping up of, uh, of, and geographical concentration of chicken factories in the southeast, um, you know, hog, hog farming in Iowa and North Carolina, and these ever, ever bigger operations that created all these problems that, um, if you want to know more about them, just go to, you know, go to my blog, I'm, I'm Mother Jones, I'm always writing about them, and the goal became cheap meat. And at the same time, even as Americans' wage, wages flatlined, meat kept getting cheaper and cheaper uh, uh, with respect to income, and you saw Americans eating more and more meat. It's leveled off recently, but now we're at, um, we're at more than half a pound per day per capita, which is a lot of meat. Um, and so the emphasis moved away from quality, moved away from quality and skilled jobs toward these big entities. So that's sort of like the broad context uh, that Rob has, uh, has walked into. Um, and yeah, I should say that he's an exotic creature for sure, <laughs> but he's not alone. There are other butch, this is, what he's doing is happening all across the country um, in, in cities everywhere. But Rob, why don't you, you start off by explaining to us your journey, how, how it is that you, you became a butcher? Sure. Um, so I, uh, I've been a, a cook in Chicago and in New York for a long time. And, uh, you know, I was worked in very good restaurants, and I went to a very good culinary school, and my interests at first were in fine dining, and I thought I was going to be, you know, the next big chef to take over the world. And um, what I learned as kind of based on my interests were, I, I was very lucky that I had, a, I had a moment where I realized that there was kind of more to this stuff than the things that I saw in the pictures in the magazines. Um, I was working as a sous chef in a restaurant and I had a, a pretty big interest in sausage making and charcuterie and salumi and that sort of stuff long before it was, it was as, you know, as trendy as it is now. Um, and I stumbled across a book called Cooking by Hand by a guy named Paul Bertoli. And uh, the book changed my life um, professionally. Uh, my, my wife used to joke that I kept my copy under my pillow at night because I always had that book in my hand. Um, but what I learned from reading this book was that there was a tradition and you know, there was a tradition involved in making charcuterie and salumi and all this stuff. It wasn't just something you made. You just didn't, you know, you didn't wake up one morning on your day off and say, I'm going to make some salami today. The tradition was, you know, you raised a hog or two and in the fall when the hog was nice and fat, you killed it. Usually like in the Italian tradition, somebody would come to your farm, to your house and they would kill your pig for you, and they would help you salt the hams for prosciutto, and salt the loins, and make 
pancetta or bacon out of the bellies and make fresh sausages and dried sausages with the shoulders and you'd make testa or head cheese with the head. You'd, you know, you, usually that day you would take the organs and the blood and make a stew. And the whole point was that you raise, you work hard all, you know, half the year to raise this pig to get nice and fat. And then, you know, at one point in the fall, you kill it and you treat every part of it equally and you turn it into a way to sustain yourself for, you know, throughout the cold winter um, when, when it's hard to get meat. Um, and that made me realize that there's more to this stuff than just, you know, the, the things that you see in the magazines or, the, or in the cookbooks and that, you know, that, that needs to be respected. Um, so I took an interest in butchering and um, I figured if I'm going to make all this stuff, I need to learn how to do it the right way. Um, fortunately, I was working for a chef who was supportive of this very expensive um, sort of learning curve, we'll, we'll say. Um, you know, there, there wasn't anybody to teach me how to butcher a pig, and there wasn't anybody to teach me how to make this stuff. I just, I, even, even the internet didn't have that much information yet. Um, but he let me buy whole pigs, and he let me cut them up, and he let me experiment. You know, it was a big restaurant. We could afford for me to make mistakes. But that's really where it all started. And um, ever since then, I, I had decided that I, you know, I wanted to work with if I couldn't work with whole animals, then I wanted to do things the most sustainable way possible. And that definitely meant dealing with small farms. Um, you know, if there's meat available to me that's you know, raised the right way and that's raised, you know, an hour away, two hours away, why would I get meat from a farm in California or from a broadliner that's getting stuff from all over the place? Um, so I made sure to put myself in situations throughout my career where I knew we were getting the kind of product that I wanted to be working with. And then when my wife and I opened our restaurant, we decided that we were gonna do our very best to be as sustainable as possible when it came to the product we used. So we only bought whole animals uh, with the exception of beef, and we just didn't have space for whole beef. So we would ask our farmers, what can't you sell? What does nobody else want? So we had a lot of beef hearts and a lot of tongues and livers and kidneys. And every once in a while, we got lucky and they'd say, I'm sitting on a bunch of sirloins. And you know, that was, that was a big weekend for us. Um, but you know, we got a reputation for that sort of thing. Um, and we were very lucky that we, you know, we got really beautiful pigs from small local farms and we would butcher them and we would feature them and we got pretty well known for it. So when, when we decided that the, the restaurant needed to close, and that's a whole other humanities issue, um, we decided that instead of opening another restaurant, we would open a butcher shop. And it was at the beginning of this, uh, this sort of, I don't know, resurgence of people our age who had discovered how great this sort of thing is. And um, we knew that there was nobody else in Chicago doing quite what we wanted to do. Um, and, and it was great for us because we could, you know, we saw, we would go to the farmer's market twice a week to supply our restaurant with produce. And we saw the same people, whether they were chefs or, or cooks that we knew, or whether it was just the, the people who lived in Chicago coming to this big farmer's market, we saw them there, the same people there, shopping with the same farmers every week. And we thought if they're willing to go out of their way to shop at a farmer's market to buy their produce, maybe they'll go to a little shop and buy their meat the same way. Um, and it was an opportunity for people in Chicago to buy the same great product that they were eating at the best restaurants to actually buy that and cook that at home. Um, but more importantly, it was, an, it was a way for people to have some transparency and to be able to come to a store like mine and talk to me, talk to my staff about, you know, the animals that we're cutting up and where they're coming from and how they're raised and what they eat. And it was an opportunity for us to provide more than just the cuts that you see in the supermarket. And, and that's, that's a really big deal to us um, because it's real easy to sell somebody a ribeye. You know, everybody knows what it is. Super easy to sell. Um, there's a lot of other parts on a cow. We got a cow in on, on Wednesday with a thousand pounds. Um, and by, by big picture standards, that's a pretty small beef. By the standards of the fact that it's me and one other guy that cuts up the beef every day, that's a lot of work to do. It's a big animal. Um, there's a lot of really, really great cuts on a thousand pound cow. There's plenty of meat to feed a lot of people, to feed, you know, a whole neighborhood, and, uh, and we like having those options. And it's, it's great for us because, you know, there are people that come into our store and money is no object to them. You know, they want a ribeye, they get a ribeye. They don't even ask how much it costs. And that's great. Um, but there are plenty of people who 
are very cost conscious and it's really great for us to be able to get just incredibly high quality meat you know the stuff that would be on the restaurant on the menus of the best restaurants in in the city in the country um, and to be able to have a, as diverse a clientele as the wealthiest and you know and the the, the struggling artist hipster kids who are still aware of what they're eating every week and we like to be able to have something to offer everyone in between. Can you, can you, I was just talking to my little opening remarks about the way that, you know, basically the supermarket meat counter took over butcher, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the butcher trade. Can, can you talk us through what sort of contrasting what goes on in one of those places, how they get their meat in one of those places versus how you get it and what, what, what the differences are and, and what sort of you're adding to this process? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting conversation because, you know, I think it was probably after, after World War II um, when, when the country was doing really well, it was very prosperous, and the, the meat supply sort of, sort of really started getting mechanized. Um, you know, people were, people were really glad that they could afford to eat things that weren't tongues and hearts and, you know, all those kind of odds and ends that, uh, that took some effort to make delicious. Um, and that you know we as a country could afford to eat not only eat more meat but eat all the expensive cuts, the loins, and you know that sort of thing. Um, and and I think I think that's kind of how how the system evolved. So the supermarkets didn't want to sell all these different cuts. They wanted to they wanted to focus on you know a small handful of things that they knew would sell and that they could get you know they could now they could get en masse because we could all afford to do it. Um, so it, it got to the point now where even, even some of the higher end supermarkets, they, instead of having a butcher that's back there cutting, you know, with a knife, cutting steaks and, and, and cutting stuff out of primals or out of larger cuts, they're getting a box, they're opening up a vacuum sealed package and there might be a whole pork loin in there and they have a bandsaw, you know, a big bandsaw that cuts through bone and a big bandsaw that cuts through boneless cuts. And everything is measured, everything's very precise, and they're just opening packages and cutting things to size. Um, there's probably a spec sheet for, you know, that, that somebody in a suit makes up and sends out to all of the properties all over the country and says, you know, you, you make sure you have this many pounds of pork chops that are that thick, this many pounds of pork chops that are, you know, smaller, and, you know, this, this many pounds of ground. And I know that, um, you know, I knew a guy who worked at, uh, who worked at a Whole Foods, and they liked advertising that they make all their own sausages. But making all their own sausages meant, you know, we're going to send a commissary is going to put together all the all the seasonings, and you know, and you're going to get a, a, a very strict list of instructions that's going to say take this much ground pork and this packet and mix it together, and then put it into this machine, and it'll spit out a bunch of links. Um, you know, and that's it's not a horrible thing, but you know, if you come to my store on a Thursday when, when Aaron's standing there hand cranking out, you know, eight, ten different kinds of sausages all mixed by hand, there's a difference. Um, and it's just getting back to the way things used to be. And w when you get a thousand pound beef in, mm -hmm. like, what form is it in? Is, is direct, like, how, how does it come to you? It's, um, it comes to us, um, right now, the, the most manageable way we can approach we can approach it. So they split the cow into sides, and the sides are, they age them for us 14 days. And then they split each side into four. So I get two whole chucks, two whole ribs, two whole what we call the short loin, which is the, the sirloin and the New York strip and the, the tenderloin, and then all the sort of flat meats and other things that are attached to that, and then the hind leg. And we, we move through them one piece at a time. Um, we get the kidneys, we get, sometimes we get the liver, that all depends on the inspector. Inspectors are brutal. Um, and uh, we get the hanger steak, because there's only one hanger steak and a cow. If you ever go out to dinner, don't order hanger steak. It's the least sustainable cut of meat, and it's super trendy. Um, so take a stand against hanger steak. Um, uh, but, you know, we get, we get as much as the USDA will, the, as the inspectors will let us have. The, you know, the pigs we get, we get two to three 250-pound hogs every week, and uh, they're split down the middle. You know, but we get the head, and we get the tongue, and the ears, and the heart, and the liver, and the kidneys, and all that stuff. And, you know, it's... I have a chest freezer that's this big. Everything else gets sold. Now, how do you, so we've, you know, we've got, we're 50 years or so away from people being used to 
making use of tongues and hearts mm -hmm. and kidneys and things like that. How do you, are, are your customers into that stuff? Or you know, how does that work? Are you able to? Yeah, I mean, we have a pretty diverse clientele. We definitely have, um, we definitely have people who are super into that stuff. And sometimes it comes in the form of cooks. And sometimes, like we had the sweetest little old French lady who stumbled upon our shop. And she was so excited that we were willing to take the brains out of lamb heads for her. Um, I mean, she was like elated that we would do this for her. She came in and I had all these lamb heads and we took the brains out and we gave her the tongues and the cheeks and she couldn't have been happier. Um, you know, she, she keeps asking us when we're going to make her boudin noir. So it's, in some cases, it's a lot of people who, um, you know, who grew up on this stuff. And in some cases, it's people who are just now discovering it. Um, and a lot of that has to do with food trends. You know, now it's very popular to, for the fanciest restaurants in the world to use these sort of, you know, bizarre cuts. You can go to a, a three Michelin star restaurant and get tongues and hearts and kidneys and things like that, sweetbreads. Um, whereas 15, 20 years ago, you know, that, that stuff just wasn't around. This stuff all went to rendering plants. And it's kind of ironic because it used to be that was the stuff that was the, the very cheapest, mm -hmm. and now it's not really available, and or it's so hard to get hold of now because of the inspection issue sure. and because there are very few shops like yours, and so that stuff almost becomes fancy. There's this inversion where yeah, it's really strange. And um, and are you seeing among um, among sort of just regular eaters are people more are, are people getting interested in making use of that stuff as you? Yeah, people are interested in making use of that stuff. I think, you know, I think the awful thing in particular is kind of a trend. So, you know, I know that if I, if I can get sweetbreads, it's an easy sell. Um, and, and a lot of that stuff, like, I have, I can sell chicken livers, duck livers, pork liver, that kind of stuff. It's pretty easy sell. The thing for us that's a hard sell is when somebody comes in and wants a particular steak, and you know, either they can't afford it or we don't have enough of it or we don't have it at all because we've sold out of it and we have all of these other cuts that just nobody's ever heard of. So that's the real trick for us is you know, selling things like a beef arm roast or a chuck flap steak or um, you know, a, a top round roast or you know, those kinds of cuts that are just not, they're sort of in this in-between state. It's not, a, it's not a fancy thing like a ribeye or a sirloin. It's not a trendy thing like offal. Um, and it's not, it's not just ground or cut up into stew meat. You know, if somebody, so, like a woman came in today and wanted a pork roast, and she didn't, she didn't want to, like without telling me, I could tell that she, she didn't want to spend the kind of money on a bone-in pork or boneless, like loin roast, because she knew it was going to be very expensive. And she, you know, that's fair enough. It's expensive. Um, so I cut her a, top, a pork top round. I got out a whole fresh ham and I took the top round off and it was, it was a six pound roast. I tried, tied it up for it and it looked beautiful and it was a third or less of the price of what, the, of, of what a smaller loin roast would have cost her. And she was so happy and it, you know, she even said, you know, it looks beautiful. And it does. You know, you can look, it's easy to look at a pork loin and think, oh, that looks, that looks delicious. But this, this odd cut that you've never seen before, you know, I think people like the fact that I'm willing to First of all, butcher it right in front of them, and then tie it up and talk them through how to how to cook it and all that. Um, you know, she was she was thrilled. And I'm guessing as a chef, you probably spend a lot. And then I went to your shop yesterday, and you're sort of at the front of the shop talking to people. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that you spend a lot of your time giving people cooking advice. Sure. Talking yeah, them through. It's it's crucial. You know, my whole staff is has been. You know, one of one of my main guys has been with me for ten years, and the other two people that work for me have you know, have been with me for a long time and they, they all have restaurant backgrounds and they all are very good cooks and it's, it's a very important part of what we do. It it's really helps us sell and I encourage my staff to take these, some of these odd cuts home um, and work with them and, and enjoy them and, you know, it, it, they, they, I love it when I, you know, they come in on a Wednesday morning after their day off and they say, hey, I took home a mock tender and, you know, I cut it in half and I cooked it two different ways and this is what I came up with and, you know, and it was really delicious this way, and it wasn't as good this way, but I could see how I could have done that differently. And then all of a sudden, they're selling mock tenders to people like nothing. And they're saying, yeah, I just cooked this at home, and this is what I did. And people get excited about it, the staff gets excited about it. And suddenly, you know, there's, there's like right now in, in, my, in my cooler, 
I still have some New York strip steaks. I still have some sirloins. But a lot of these bizarre cuts that people are familiar with, they're gone. All the Paleron steaks, how many people have heard of a Paleron steak? I haven't. Well, I'm sold out of them. <laughs> I, get, I get six of them a week and they're gone. They were gone by Friday. Um, and that's, that's really important to us and we're really, really proud of that. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to sell a sirloin. If I'm ever long on sirloins, I can discount them and you know, then I know they'll sell, but that's yet to be a problem. Um, but getting rid of these other cuts is, is a really big deal. And um, talk us through how you deal with farmers, how you choose the farmers that you work with and ha how that relationship goes. Um, that's actually, it's pretty easy these days. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the big issues for me uh, being in Chicago is that, you know, a lot of people want grass-fed beef, 100% grass-fed beef, um, for a lot of different reasons. Some, some I can appreciate and some I think are a little superficial, but um, it's hard to find really good grass-fed beef. And at the end of the day, you know, my, one of my main objectives is to sell a quality product to people. So I'm not gonna get something just because it's 100% grass-fed if it's not quality. So I, it took me a long time, but I, I'm working with a farmer now, and it's, they're a great operation. It's a very small farm. They're in Ottawa, Illinois, and they, they finish their beef on corn, but it's corn that they grow. So it's non-GMO. It's kind of the best case scenario in, in my situation because they, you know, they're, they're growing a small amount of this stuff, and they give it to them. Um, and, you know, and people have confronted me about it, and they say, well, you know, cows aren't supposed to eat corn. And, and I do understand that, and I really wish I could find really great grass-fed beef, but I, you know, I say, well, I'm not supposed to eat ice cream. Um, <laughs> but every once in a while, in small amounts, it's not gonna, not gonna hurt me that much. And that's kind of, you know, these cows get just a little bit so they can put on a little bit of extra fat, and it results in some amazing beef. Um, and these people came to me which is an amazing thing right now is that, you know, for me, I get phone calls and emails every week uh, from farmers who have, have heard about us somehow, you know, uh, that, that are raising heritage breed pigs or they're raising, they're raising beef or they're raising, you know, lamb or chickens or whatever and they, they're trying to get into the Chicago market and they want us to, to work with them. And, um, you know, we have farmers that we've worked with for a long time and it's all because we, you know, either they come to us or we hear about them through our, our, our chef friends and um, and they, you know, and we start these relationships, and it's, you know, it's great. Uh, you know, you work with people on price, which is one thing, but mainly on quality. And if if they're raising animals that are consistently really great and at a price that I can afford, you know, we develop these great relationships, and it, it works out wonderfully. You know, we can we can talk to our pig farmers. We can say, hey, you know, the we noticed the pork was a little different this week. Why would that be? And they could say, well, you know, it's, the weather's getting colder, so their feet is changing a little, or, um, you know, we, we you know, it, there's, there's all kinds of reasons why, why, why the meat can be different from week to week. Um, but when we find somebody that can be consistent week to week, that's great. And then you've developed these relationships and they, they work with you. They, you know, you can say, you know, Easter's coming up. Are you going to have enough lamb for me? And they'll say, well, we'll make, sure, we'll make sure you're covered above all else. You know, Thanksgiving's coming up. Are you going to have, you know, are we going to have enough turkeys? You know, that's, how many do you think you want? And we'll say, oh, well, you know, we'll probably sell 150 turkeys this season. They'll say, we'll make sure you get 150 turkeys. So you wind up developing these great relationships, and it's the same kind of relationships that we like to have with our customers. We want them to know that, you know, our regulars are, are taken care of and looked out for, and it's, it's this whole wonderful cycle. Um, so I, I kind of... In my opening, I kind of raised this nightmare scenario of sort of the butcher trade being crushed by these big forces and then you being the sort of rounding error. But in fact, it is coming back um, and you're part of uh, a, a, a movement, I would say. Can you talk us through the national scene, like what you're seeing in other cities um, in, this, in, this, um, in this field? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I was just out in San Francisco a few weeks ago, and there's uh, a, couple of, a couple of women out there in the Bay Area started a thing called the Butcher's Guild. And it's, um, it's basically an online community trying to network people like, people like me who do what I do all over the country. And in some cases, there's, there, uh, all over the world, there's uh, a few people in Canada, and there's a guy who I got to meet who has an amazing butcher shop in, uh, in Lima, Peru. And uh, there was about 30 of us there, and you know, having discussions a lot like this. 
um, you know, where do you, about talking about sourcing and talking about feed and talking about working with customers and different cuts and um, it's, it's, it's definitely still a small, uh, small number of us that are doing this, but it's, it's a small number of people who are very, very serious about it. And, and we, all, we all recognize the fact that there are a lot of people in all of our cities who are interested in learning this and interested in bringing this back. I mean, again, I get, I get emails and phone calls all the time from, from cooks and, and from all kinds of people who really want to learn about butchering. And in some cases, it's people who think they want to do it as a profession. In some cases, it's people who you know, are interested in, you know, they're hunters and they want to learn how to, how to, you know, they go and shoot a deer, they want to be able to process it themselves. Or, you know, people who aren't happy in their current job and want a, a career change and their grandfather was a butcher and they think, you know, I would like to bring that tradition back to my family. So we get, you know, there's, there's a lot of interest in this. And I think it's coupled with the fact that more and more and, you know, largely due to people like you and, and, and the reporting done at Mother Jones, um, people are aware of what's going on in the, in the food system, you know, nationally and globally and, and how it affects them locally and, and people want to change that. You know, they're, they're not content to just go to the store and buy stuff. Now they want answers. They want some of this transparency and, you know, we're starting to provide that. So now I think we should probably uh, switch over and talk about that um, unpleasant topic of, you know, what it means for us to be um, to be killing animals, and I want to say that uh, I'm someone who cooks meat, and I was just telling Rob before that I was a uh, cook at a steakhouse in high school uh, for like six or seven years, going into college, um, and um, on Maverick Farms, which is this farm that I helped start and run in North Carolina, um, we did these farm dinners, and I was also obsessed with that book, Cooking by Hand. Um, mm. Didn't get too much into his charcuterie, but um, it's really a fantastic, beautifully written cookbook. And um, I cooked up a, a good amount of meat on Maverick, and we would, we would, uh, we we actually are now raising a few pigs, but back then we would get meat from our neighbors, from neighboring farms usually. Um, and uh, and I am, I think there's this sort of conventional wisdom that if you're going to be a meat eater um, and sort of face the moral quandary of eating meat then you should be able to kill an animal. And I think, you know, Michael Pollan in the, at the end of Omnivore's Dilemma goes out into the woods with a gun and shoots a, pit, a wild pig. And this is just sort of this kind of rite of passage for meat eaters now. And I want to say that I've never been able to do that. I've never reconciled myself with that. And I want to tell a ridiculous story um, that kind of illustrates my, um, my, my take up my sort of the position that I find myself in on meat. And that is at one time, this is like three or four years ago, um, we were uh, was just having Thanksgiving dinner at the farm, just for friends and family. It wasn't a, a farm dinner. And um, one of my fellow farmers uh, was able to go and drive and get a, um, a baby pig. Um, and her friend who knew, who knew how to like make a little spit was going to um, make a little spit and we're going to cook it up. And that was going to be our thanks, our, sort of the center of our Thanksgiving table. And I was both excited, and they were going to slaughter the pig on the farm. Mm -hmm. And I was both excited about this as a food lover that we're, I'm going to, you know, we're going to eat some like suckling pig, and we're going to roast it. And it's going to be amazing. But I was also a bit horrified that we we're going to be slaughtering this pig on the farm, and I sort of couldn't face it. And um, we had this kind of picture window that leads out to the driveway, and um, I saw my, you know, the fellow farmer pull up, and I saw him, saw him get out of the car, and. It, uh, it was in the back of the truck that the pig came out. And I'm watching this going, oh my god, this is so intense, I really can't handle this. And they put the pig in this little pen. Uh, they kind of made a little makeshift pen in the, kind of in the driveway area and came into the farmhouse and, you know, they were talking to us and you know, we all just started talking. And I looked out the window and I saw the pig was about to escape from this little pen. And then I saw him or her, I can't remember what it was, literally bust out of this pen and go running up the driveway and we're surrounded by woods. This, this pig would have immediately assimilated itself into the woods. And I'm, watch, I'm watching this happen, kind of, on the one hand, kind of shocked that there goes Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> and the first thought is I should tell these people the pig is running away so they can go chase it down. On the other hand, I was rooting for the pig going, the pig, <laughs> like the slaughter's not gonna happen, the pig's going into the woods. 
And I, I stood there just silent, and they saw my face, the shock on my face, and they looked around, and they, just in time, they saw the pig running up, and they, they chased it down, and, um, and then literally, so they got the pig back, but, um, but not because I, I made us think about it, and then literally, um, the slaughter happened um, not that far from, I, the kitchen is where I worked in the farmhouse, and it was literally the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and, um, and I was working on a blog post, uh, like I, um, I am, am, am so often doing. And I was literally working on an unrelated blog post, blocking it out, when I heard shrill screams. And it wasn't the pig, it was my girlfriend freaking out. <laughs> it was another one of our, our fellow farmers. And then the, the pig was slaughtered, and we had it, and I ate it, it was delicious. But I have never, as an animal lover, I have never been able to recon reconcile, or you know, I used to not think about it at all, um, but now with books like Jonathan Saffron Fowler's book and, and other books, um, I've never been able to fully reconcile the killing of another creature, except to say that I, as a student of agriculture, I know that the very most sustainable agriculture is agriculture that integrates animals and plants, and it's, um, it isn't necessarily essential to a sustainable agriculture, but it really is the most efficient uh, way to do it. And the other thing is that as someone who loves food and loves the, the traditions of the, the food traditions of the world, every, nearly, not every, but nearly every culture um, that, that we know about um, has had a tradition of eating meat. And I don't want to live in the world without um, Iberian ham or uh, Hamon Serrano and things like this that I that I adore, and so that's basically my kind of weak reconciliation of it. And I'm wondering how you think about the sort of vegan challenge. M maybe we'll get a vegan challenge from the audience. Who knows? <laughs> in a second, as we open it up to questions. Sure, um, it's it's a really difficult thing, and it's something that that I also struggle with. Um, be, because it's I mean, I mean it is it is it is taking a life. And it's it's a really hard thing to face, and you know I've I've butchered hundreds of pigs, um, and I had a, a a somewhat similar experience. We have some friends who have a, a farm in uh, out near Traverse City, Michigan, and they every year they raise a small amount of pigs, um, and it's you know the pigs are pastured and they root around and they have a good time, and um, in the fall. They're, they let them run free in their neighbor's orchard. Um, it's uh, all organic fruit and chestnuts, and they, they eat, eat all this wonderful, uh, wonderful stuff. And um, it's some of the most delicious pork I've ever had. Um, and we decided last year that the staff was going to go up there, and we were not only were we going to get a pig, but we were going to you know we were going to go up there and meet our pig, and um, you know be be part of killing it and, and you know, skin it, gutting it, and the whole process from, from live to packed up and on its way back to the shop. And it was, it, I mean, like, I, it's really hard to talk about. It was such a monumental experience for me and for my staff, and just the amount of, uh, of respect we have for that animal, the fact that we made sure that nothing, I mean, absolutely nothing got wasted. We were eating all the parts that the USDA will take away from us normally. I mean, and, and we as a shop, we as the staff, we ate the lungs, we ate the kidneys, we ate the heart, we ate, I mean, every last thing. That day on the farm, um, you know, we took some of the trimmings and the blood and we made a stew and we actually sat outside, you know, after we'd finished butchering for the day and we, you know, we sort of celebrated this animal and all the work that went into raising it and, and everything else by, you know, we, we cooked some of it right there. And, um, you know, it was it, it was an amazing experience, and it wasn't it wasn't anything that I took a great amount of pleasure in um, watching an animal die, but it was something that I felt I needed to do as a butcher, and it it very much changed the experience for me. The next week, when you know when our animals were delivered, everything looked different, and everything was done much more carefully, and everything was sold to our customers with with a lot more respect, and I feel like it was pr the the best thing I could have done for myself and for my staff and also kind of the most uh, humbling um, to, to, to watch this happen. And uh, you know, I was lucky I was, able to write, I was able to write about it for a local publication and that helped me kind of come to terms with, with what I had just been through. But it, I mean, it definitely strengthened us. I think it's, you know, I think the, the main moral dilemma is that 
we're so used to being in a society where we can eat on average a half a pound of meat a day. Was that what it was? Yeah. And that's that's ridiculous. Um, you know, meat should be treated as a luxury item. It should be the kind of thing that um, you know we treat ourselves to maybe a couple times a week, um, and definitely let a little bit go a long way, and definitely choose where it's coming from, and be you know ask questions and be particular, and don't just eat meat for the sake of eating it. You know, understand that you're eating what was once a life. Um, you know, I, I was very fortunate to be able to, uh, when I was in San Francisco, um, Dario Cecchini, who's probably the most famous butcher in the world, did a presentation at this event, and he said, you know, two of the most important things with what we do is making sure that the animal has is is treated with respect both in its life and in its death, and and it's 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 important. You know, he said you have to you have to see beyond the knife, beyond your hand, beyond you know, beyond the trend of it all, and you see that there is a life before you on your butcher block and that every part is equal. You know, people come into the store all the time and they say, what's the best cut of meat? And that's the most absurd question you can ask me. Um, and it's the kind of thing that if I'm, if I'm not in, you know, if, if I'm not sort of careful, <laughs> if you catch me off guard, I can get pretty upset. <laughs> um, and it, but it's because we're so, like, we really, really feel very strongly that there is no best cut. You know, it can be, it can be distilled a lot of different ways. You know, what do you, what do you want to make? If you want to make beef stew, then beef tenderloin is not the best cut of meat. You know, but, you know, like for, for him, he said he grew up eating these things, like his grandmother would take would take uh, the section where the knee is, and it's this funny little kneecap with a sort of an odd little scraggle of meat around it, and she would make the most amazing stew, and it had so much flavor, um, you know, and things like the tendons and the muzzle and the hooves and, you know, all these different organs would get cooked in all these different ways, and, you know, and that was, not only was that delicious and part of his, his childhood and his life growing up, as, as the son of a butcher and the grandson of a butcher, but that was family. That was everything about his family that he remembers was sitting around a table and, and eating, and it was always eating the things that no one else would buy, and that, would, that became a very important part of his life, and that was what he wanted to make sort of the, the most important aspect of what he does for a living. So as he travels and talks to people like me, the next generation that are sort of taking over for him as he gets older, he sort of begs us, implores us to understand that there is not a premium cut of meat off of a cow, that the whole thing, it, it, it's up to us to make sure that we're only getting the best and that the best means an animal that was raised well, treated fairly, you know, treated properly, given the best possible life, the longest life. He doesn't cut veal and he doesn't cut lamb because he doesn't believe in cutting up an animal that doesn't live a long, full life. And, you know, it gives you a lot to think about. You know, do I think eating meat is is the right thing to do? I don't know. I make, I make a living as a butcher and I'm still not sure how I feel about that. Um, but I feel very proud of the fact that I can offer you the best case scenario. Well, not many butchers are gonna tell you that to eat meat a couple, only a couple times a week at, at most. So that, that's a pretty amazing <laughs> Yeah, statement. I get a lot of flack for that. <laughs> um, but it's true, you know, people, we were talking about this earlier, people just assume that if you come to my house for dinner, it's going to be, you know, a giant pile of bacon and it's going to be a giant steak and, you know, we're going to have pork chops for dessert. Um, <laughs> which, if you know me, you know that my wife is the greatest pastry chef in the world and that I'd be a, I'd be a fool to take over dessert. Um, but really, we, we don't eat a lot of meat at home. And, you know, we're lucky that we have access to some amazing quality stuff. So, you know, on Mondays when I'm when I'm home, I try and cook something, and so that's that's kind of a treat. You know, I'm, we're home all day; it's a family day, and you know, like last I think it was last Saturday, we sat down and had uh, we had red beans and rice, and I you know slow cooked some ham hocks and and some uh, sausage from the shop the week before. I had roasted a chicken with some vegetables, and you know it was great. It was my wife and I and our my two year old daughter, and uh, you know she was sharing in the meal just like the two of us, and it was it's it's a really wonderful thing. Um, but, you know, there's leftovers, and that gets us through a couple of days, and maybe we'll take home a little bit of sausage and incorporate that into something, but we don't have meat six, seven nights a week. We have it two or three nights a week, um, and it's just, you know, we just choose when we want to have it. We don't, vegetables are delicious um, and also very sustainable and a lot easier to get, and, uh, you know, we, we eat a lot of vegetables, and we love them. Um, doesn't mean we don't cook them in bacon fat or, or pork fat, but... 
uh, you know, and I, I don't, I say that seriously because it's all, it's all part of, of how we approach cooking. You know, if, if we're going to cook bacon for breakfast on a Monday or Tuesday morning when we're home together, you know, we're going to save all the bacon drippings and it goes in a thing in our freezer. And then if we're going to cook some vegetables, then why should I use oil when I have, you know, fat rendered from an animal that I butchered and turned into bacon? It's right here. It's all, you know, there's, there's no reason to use anything else. And it's become clear in public health circles that the whole demonization of animal fat that happened in the 60s and 70s mm -hmm. and 80s uh, was a complete wrong turn. Oh, yeah. This idea of using you know, certain corn oils or, or soy oils as being superior to pork fat or tallow mm -hmm. or chicken fat is just wrong. Yeah. And it really kind of contributed to the health crisis yep. that, that we're in. Well, listen, um, we should now turn it over to questions from the audience, and I believe we have a couple of microphones coming around. And so, um, who wants to challenge us on vegan terms or <laughs> ask about butchering? Here we go. Hear me? Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, I was a vegetarian for 17 years. I eat meat now, mostly from Rob's butcher shop. Um, I also was a member of People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. I'm um, oh, just wow. found myself there. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to ask you two about whether or not you feel like the animal rights movement has in a lot of ways been a boon to this idea of of the food culture that we're living in now where people really do think about where their, their meat comes from and how it's raised? I will go first and say that I would say absolutely. I would say that um, one of the things that's happening right now, that has been happening for about 10 years, maybe longer, is that certain animal rights groups, I think the, the really effective ones are like the Humane Society of the United States, and I think there's one called Mercy for Animals, and there are a few others that have been um, essentially sneaking people into animal facilities to work, posing as workers and packing cameras and documenting what's going on inside. And it might sound extreme and it might sound like a sort of a violation or something of these companies' rights or something, but the thing is, they are extremely protective and extremely secretive about what goes on inside, say, a factory hog farm. And as members of the public, we, we have no idea what's going on. We, we are dealing with the waste from these operations, getting into water, um, causing all kinds of uh, health problems. We're dealing with... Um, antibiotic resistant pathogens that are being developed on these farms because they feed uh, animals daily low doses of antibiotics. So there's all these public health problems that were being foisted upon us and we have no view inside of them. And so these groups, uh, they, you know, they, they go in and document things like, um, you know, just, I don't even want to get into it, just horrible, you know, sometimes be beatings of animals uh, animals that um, where the slaughter didn't go very well over and over again, and they're not the animals aren't really stunned before they get um, before they get slaughtered. Um, things things that are routine, like the fact that um, a, a, um, a pregnant sow on a factory farm. And this is changing a little bit, but in, in most cases, can't move. They're in these tiny pens where they can't even move around. And that's true of, uh, also true of, uh, of hens that are, uh, uh, that are laying eggs in, um, in egg laying farms. And these groups have been able to sneak in and document and show to the public. And so I would say absolutely um, they've been extremely helpful for me as a journalist um, in, in documenting these things. I do think that, um, that sometimes a group like PETA can, can go too far. And I also have seen I feel like someone like me or someone like Rob, we are dealing, you know, like when I, I write a little occasional recipe column on Mother Jones that occasionally has meat in it, um, and I will sometimes get uh, an angry backlash from, say, a vegan reader, or I'm sure sometimes there are people that think Rob is committing some crime by, by what he's doing. And what I always want to tell critics like that is that we agree on 99% because 99% or something approaching that of the kind of, of 
meat that's being produced in this country, we are actively working against in our various different ways. And there's this 1% that maybe that you can attack us over, but let's focus on the 99% first. Let's, let's transform that system um, and then maybe you can come after us. When the system's transformed, maybe you can come after us for the fact that we participate in various ways in the killing of animals. So that's kind of my answer is that, you know, mostly they're a very positive force. And there are, I know vegans in those groups who uh, I work with actively and sort of get that, um, that, that difference. But I'd be curious to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't have said it much better. Um, I think, you know, I think the thing to watch out for is that there's always the extremists. There are, there are always the, the sort of diehard, uh, you know, vegan, sort of militant vegans that are gonna think that no matter what I do, I'm evil because there's the death of an animal involved. And, you know, and in that case, I know that I'm never ever gonna convince that person that I'm okay, but I think, you know, like you said, the, the bigger picture is that, you know, there's, there's the right way to do something and there's, there's the wrong way, and the wrong way is so horrible that that's where the effort needs to be focused. Um, you know, for, for those of us that are gonna continue to eat meat, there is an option. And, and, you know, I, I as, a, as, a, as a businessman and as a butcher, I'm trying to present my public with that option. I'm trying to present my community with the option to get the most transparent meat possible. Um, and, you know, and I think I've sort of gotten the okay from some, some of the more relaxed, down-to-earth animal rights people. Great. Um, right here, middle of the, oh, I'm sorry. I guess we already have one queued up, but we'll get to you next. Yes. Um, what do you see as the role of like fish in, or seafood in general, um, both in like a practical health and ec economic standpoint and as like an ethical standpoint? Because I think in general it's a lot easier to like respect or sympathize with mammals than you know like a fish or shrimp. Um, so I was just wondering your opinion. Well, seafood is a, is a really big and, and naughty issue. And, and once again, it's, um, there's so many cultures that have been eating seafood for so long, and it's such an amazing food when it's not, you know, uh, adulterated in some way. It, you, know, it's this, you know, it's basically one of the last sources of wild food that we are able to enjoy on a large basis. It's also a fantastic source of protein, obviously, fantastic source of all kinds of, uh, you know, healthy fats. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you know, the oceans are, um, I, I can't think of any environmental situation that is more horrifying than what's happening to the oceans, not just from overfishing, but also from climate change, from pollution. And so there are people that are sort of doing what Rob is doing with seafood, sourcing it very carefully. There's fishmongers, maybe here in Chicago, but especially in coastal cities that are working really hard to get fish that aren't overfished, that aren't, um, you know, full of, you know, unfortunately, the oceans are our dumps, and a lot of our waste ends up in the ocean, and it works its way up the food chain, and that's why there's mer mercury is not in fish because there's lots of mercury in the ocean naturally. Mercury is in fish because of coal-fired power plants um, produce a lot of mercury, and that's where it ends up. And so it's a, it's, a very, it's a very naughty issue. And then you have the whole complicated issue, and I think I've, we've got four minutes left, so we can't even get into it, of uh, <laughs> now half of our seafood comes from, uh, fact, basically, not in every case, but basically factory fish farms that are very analogous to the, the factory animal farms that we're talking about. So to make a long story short, I would say just be, Treat it with the same way that you treat meat and look for people like Rob and Butcher and Larder that are doing similar things with fish. Yep. Okay, <laughs> we do have another one queued up. I can ask it, Sam. Um, I was just wondering if you could expand a little on the point you made that, or claim that you made that an integrated animal and um, plant farm or agriculture is it wasn't clear, like, at least as sustainable or right. possibly more sustainable. I mean, I, I yeah. guess I want to hear the argument for it being more sustainable. If well, the most efficient systems are systems, so, and what, you know, basically, the, the, so it kind of goes back to the founder of, or, of organic farming, modern organic farming, this guy, Sir Albert Howard, uh, was a, a British um, 
he was a British student, uh, scholar of agriculture, um, uh, and he, in his investigations, and basically his investigation, you know, where he really kind of had his biggest insights were, were in India, were sort of watching the way, you know, he was sent to India in the early 20th century to teach these, the, the sort of savages in the colonies how to do agriculture. And, you know, basically it was sort of colonial agriculture where they would produce food in the colonies and send it back to, to Mother England. And he got there and he realized that he didn't have very much to teach them. There was a lot to learn there. And he noticed that they were uh, cycling manure into fields and building uh, soil fertility that way. And he began to realize that the best farming systems mimic nature. And wherever you are, like in a sort of uh, a native forest or you know, here in the Midwest, uh, what used to be these amazing ecosystems that were prairies, animals were always involved. Animals recycle nutrients. Um, animals pre perform all of these different things that we call uh, ecological services. Um, that, word, that, that phrase wasn't developed um, in Sir Albert Howard's time. But basically, they perform these critical services that are essentially um, uh, recycling nutrients. And so, you know, for example, uh, a traditional farm in the Midwest would have some pigs that would be outside, basically rooting around on pastures that would, would, would move around, and their, food, their feed would be supplemented, their sort of diet would be supplemented by all different kinds of farm waste. So, you know, nothing goes to waste on a traditional farm. And so, you know, second, like uh, things that couldn't be sold. Um, and then also some corn would be grown uh, for those pigs. So it goes into their diet. Um, they either directly fertilize fields by rooting around in them and they'll later be planted, or their manure maybe over winter is collected in a barn and brought back out um, into, um, into that system. And their manure is full of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium and other micronutrients and organic matter, and it build, you create this system where it builds organic matter and microbial life in soils. And um, you know, essentially what we've done is we've, we've split that system, and we've concentrated, instead of having this extensive system of agriculture where you've got these things working together, we've concentrated the hog farming all in one place. Um, a lot of it not too far from here in, in Iowa and parts of Illinois, where you concentrate way more waste that can ever be absorbed by the land around, around these farms, that doesn't stop them from doing it anyway, so they way over apply this manure. Um, it, it's also full of all these dodgy chemicals and additives, and it leaches into water. Um, it over fertilizes the soil uh, and causes all these problems. When um, if, you, if you kept it together, it actually is this super efficient way to uh, recycle nutrients, and you need far less added nitrogen and phosphorus and stuff that creates its whole own level of, I, I could talk for the next hour about the, um, the various problems that we have with fertility in this country, but it, it, it basically is an efficient system for recycling nutrients on, on farms, if that is not too complicated of an answer for you. And um, Wendell Berry said that when we, when we, split, those, when we split those operations up, we took a great solution and created two problems from it. Because now you got over fertilization here, then you've got these other farms that need fertilization that they have to import, and they, these become basically the two major problems of our agricultural system. So let's do one more question and then we have to cut it off. Um, we have two people back here on this side. We have time for one more, yeah. This is the last one. So a few years back in Chicago, we banned foie gras, mm -hmm. uh -huh. and then there were many people who cheered and thought it was very progressive, and, and then a whole lot of other people thought it was very regressive and barbaric, and Chicago would be viewed as a barbaric city if we allowed this to happen. So I just would be interested in hearing your view of what you're doing is sort of might be viewed as regressive, right, but not and at the same time by a bunch of us as progressive. And what do you think it's gonna to take to get to society to this point where, where we start treating things or behaving more humanely in general? It's a big question. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the, what I'm doing versus the, you know, the, the whole controversy over foie gras are, are kind of two different things. I think 
I think it's easy to pick on something like foie gras because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to characterize that as, as a very awful thing, that, that the, the ducks and the geese are treated very poorly, and as a result, we get this luxury item. And, uh, you know, that's not always the case anymore um, as, in terms of the way the ducks are raised. Um, and it's also, you know, it's, it's focusing on a very tiny issue when there's much bigger issues to focus on. Um, you know, I think, I think banning foie gras anywhere is, it's, it's just sort of a waste of an effort because there's a very small percentage of people that eat that, um, but the systems that make the food that the masses eat are so, so broken. Um, you know, I think things like this are a great way to, uh, you know, to sort of bring to light the, the problems. And I think, I think having, having social media and the internet, I think it, it's, they're all great resources. And I think the more people in my situation who understand that there is, there is a place for us to, to do what we think is right and open small stores like this and work with farms, um, the more of us that start doing this, uh, you know, the, the more exposure there is. Um, so from that regard, if, if it becomes a trendy thing to be a butcher, then if it gets the word out that there's a, an alternative to get meat that's raised the right way, or to even just start the discussion as to why should I shop with this guy when I can go to the supermarket, then that's, you know, that's a great way to sort of just bring it to the public. And the, the more that happens, the more it goes from being uh, a discussion for, for the elite to a discussion for the masses. And you know, if, if college kids are talking about it, if it's being talked about in high schools, um, you know, we had a woman come into the store a couple of days ago and she teaches on the south side of Chicago, teaches, uh, I think, elementary school, and she bought a bunch of beef bones because she wanted to teach her class how to make stock. And I thought that was so cool. Um, I gave her a discount. Um, <laughs> But, but, you know, but that's, that's how it needs to happen. And we, you know, we need to have people who are interested in this um, and presenting it almost as a, less as a lecture and more as a debate. So, you know, like, should we eat animals? And if so, what, what should we be eating? And, you know, really kind of getting into the things that we've talked about today, you know, you, there's, there's more to a, like we've said before, there's more to a pig than a pork chop. There's more to a cow than a ribeye. Um, and, and making that sort of become the discussion and become the, you know, b become sort of the normal, the normal way to think about it. You know, there isn't just the cuts at the supermarket. There's, there's a lot more to choose from. And the more we realize that that's, you know, the more we make that part of the everyday discussion of what we're eating and what we're feeding our families, then the more it becomes the norm. And the more we, people are looking for the right thing you know, or the, the most ethical thing to, to be feeding their families. All right, well, thank you very much for coming out. Um, <laughs> talking to you, Rob.